evening's closing speaker, Brittany Packman. Public 
homeschooled to return home to raise her own children with her new husband that knew that despite her pride, the same system that educated her was still not the best the city had to offer. So she searched, she searched and searched and searched until she found a brick building with big red doors that shares her values of rigor and diversity. And even though we now lived in the very tree-lined, quiet suburbs that white St. Louis's had once built to escape black St. Louis's in the city, just like my mother when she was a little girl, and that getting to that brick school with the big red doors would be a 35-minute drive and financial sacrifice that even her good middle-class job would be a stretch for, she knew that it was worth it for her baby girl. And so in choosing New City School, where's New City? Hi! <laughs> in choosing this city school, she found a school that would teach the black national anthem to every child and not just hers. She found a school that would give me the necessary skills to understand the important solidarity between black folks and indigenous folks in just the third grade, and the audacity to explain to a white classmate the value of an affinity group in the fourth grade and provide me the ability to both preserve my pride in my own identity and also understand the value and globalism that I began to grasp in my sixth grade world religions unit. But my story is also a story of transitioning to a secondary school that taught me much, but was also filled with students who were great people but hadn't necessarily had that same big red door experience. My story is the story of a daddy's girl who lost her daddy just a few months after starting that new school in the seventh grade and attempting to negotiate life without him, a life that no longer made much sense and yet gave me a sense of duty to understand his liberation theology and continue his justice work. Mine is the story of an adolescent black girl with a changing body and a normal teenage desire to be found fun and attractive, but instead to be told that I'm angry and that I'm cute but you never take me home because I'm black. Mine is the story of, of sitting in social studies class discussing desegregation and listening to my classmates lament how dangerous their affluent neighborhood public school had become because those kids had been busted not knowing their parents sent them to school with me just to get away from kids just like me. Mine is the story of my white friends joking that they had planned to hide their jewelry and watches before heading to play Ruth for North, a private, mostly black high school near my house with the so-called ghetto cheerleaders, one of whom was my cousin. Mine is the story of none of my friends telling me until months later that our white classmate's mom had suddenly made him break up with me because I'm black. All the time, I had wondered why she went from smiles to grimaces during our courtship, grimaces that I saw daily because she worked at the school. Mine is the story of my English teacher telling me that the paper that I got the very best grade on that year should be submitted to the literary magazine as long as I take out that stuff about the Black Panthers. Of course, mine is also a story of investment, of me attending this very conference in, I'm about to date myself, 1997, and having my dad's own former student, Daniel Harris, believe in me enough to have me, an eighth grader, facilitate a group at a high school conference. My story is me deciding to band together with other student leaders at my school who attended to found our school's first diversity club and make speeches in assembly about injustice and equity. But my story is also a story of harassment, of being followed around by a white man who was an upperclassman who thought diversity, et cetera, was nothing but an attempt to create a problem where there was none, of having that upperclassman follow closely behind me between classes and ask me if his whiteness was oppressing me or offending me today. My story is a story of me thinking I just have to put up with it because no one was going to believe my word over his of finally deciding to tell him to stop, of him deciding at that moment to spit at me, right there in the hallway at school. It's a story of getting nothing more than a terse apology and him getting no punishment at all, of realizing that he was the son of a trustee, so wealthy that he lived across the street from the school in a neighborhood that still didn't have street lights, but plenty of strictly private neighborhood signs to keep the rest of us out, and that this was how the game worked. Now this is normally where I stop telling the story. This is where I stop and I tell people that justice work is hard, but it is always 
worth it because truth is always right. Right here is where I usually remind people that if simply discussing items of equity and raising awareness of injustice made him that mad, we must be on to something. That after all, that was after all a critical moment of preparation. In retrospect, his words prepared me to be called nigger online almost daily. Perhaps that spit prepared me for the tear gas that I choked on in the streets of Ferguson. The, the decision I made to continue on in the face of such vitriol was an early lesson that righteousness, especially when performed by people of color, will yield hatred in response. This was the first real moment I had to know that I was scared. But what my father's legacy and my mother's lessons and my ancestors' struggle required of me to do was, in so many words, was to boss up and work anyway. That the shoulders on which I stand, like Hank Aaron's and John Lewis's and Catherine King Ferris's, had stared down far worse, and thus I need to become ever more vigilant, ever more serious about justice work, despite or really because of this moment. That the song that titled that Henry Hampton docuseries my parents had made me watch as a child so that I would know the wealth from which I come had to keep ringing in my head. I know the one thing we did right was the day we started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. Because you see, bigotry creates a moral imperative. People of good conscience must resist. In the face of hate, resistance is a requirement. Love, hope, unbridled joy, my unapologetic blackness and swinging braids and continued assembly speeches, they'd all be there to slap the spit away and resist the cancer that threatened to end me and little did he know hurt him too. But with each of you, with this charge before us in our schools, in this era of nationalism and shameless bigotry, in this time where the most vile presentations of Islamophobia, homophobia, racism, sexism, rape culture, and xenophobia are found to be, as Van Jones said, not merely, merely distasteful, but not disqualifying. In this space where discrimination is nothing more than a winning campaign tactic, I don't get to stop the story there. Because in this room, sits power. You are either busy developing the leaders of today and tomorrow, or you are one. You see, protest is, at its very core, the act of speaking the truth, out loud and in public. If protest is speaking truth out loud, I don't get to tell you the well-fashioned, audience-tested, often uh, half-spoken version of my story. I have to speak truth to power. Because the truth is, the story is far from over. The story continued when, completely subconsciously, I buried that moment. Deep down in the recesses of my mind, I decided to suppress the truth of that harassment, that assault, and the permissive response. I'm a black woman. I'm she, her, hers, sis, daughter, homegirl. My persistence is learned and necessary. I am Brazilian, even though I shouldn't always have to be. Especially at 15. Especially not facing down a racist. Especially not with, with only one protector, the same teacher who believed in me for that eighth grade conference. So part of the story is that I buried the story to survive, to persist, to suppress the trauma and ignore my pain, to do that thing that women of color, people of color always have to do to be our resilient selves. Now this is the People of Color Conference, so I know you know what I'm talking about. That mind-bending trick of exercising your double consciousness and the sole way task of bearing double, triple, quadruple burdens with all of your intersections every second of every day of every school year. I, I, I know you know that moment where you breathe your last free breath before you walk into whatever double doors separate the place where you're free from the place where you're always confined to other status. The moment when you want to scream, no, what country are you from? Because I'm from here. <laughs> no, my job is not permission to ask me if I know any terrorists. No, don't touch my hair. 
that this wouldn't happen in your school. That this is a Missouri problem, but it wouldn't happen in your state. This is a slave state problem, but it wouldn't happen up north. This is, these institutions that are different than yours, that it wouldn't happen in your liberal bastion. But to pretend as if my story is unique is analogous to only discussing a plant when it's fully grown. To ignore its roots, the food we fed it, and the light we shine. is bound 
lines up with mine and that the oppression Olympics and hierarchy of races plays into the hands of oppression instead of dismantling supremacy, we harm ourselves. We have to own that every person we allow to grow up out of these unchecked spaces is one of ours. We have to own my story as our story, collectively and corporately. But know this, I did not come here to tell you a sob story. I came here to give you a cautionary tale. I did not come here to ask for your pity. I came here to demand your power. In this room sits the power to teach, to lead, to influence, to touch lives that can act for righteousness or for hatred, who can hurl spit or hurl inspiration. The power that inhabits this room will shape generations of leaders. So I don't ask for your tears, I ask for your attention, your action, and your impact. Because you see, I'm a sucker for happy endings. I'm a sucker for hopeful endings. I'm a believer in our ability to write a story that includes and empowers all of us, if we choose, every day to wield our power with the deepest sense of responsibility to one another and the health of the human spirit. So what is our responsibility? We must build. If protest is telling the truth, out loud and in public, then we have to build institutions that not only encourage that spirit, but require it. Build institutions that abide by the truths you are told, not just from a rich trustee's son, but also a scholarship kid from the black part of the county. If we could program our way out of oppression, I wouldn't be standing before you. Michael Brown would still be alive, the movement would be the stuff of Hollywood magic. So build institutions that don't just try to program us to death, but that systematize equity and culturally responsive practices, instead of just throwing out a program at the problem. <laughs> build institutions that don't just hire staff of color, but ensure that our chances for advancement, our experiences of friendship, support, and mentorship are just as common as everyone else's, because that's what it means to not only be diverse, but to be equitable and inclusive. Let's do that. You see, it's not, it's not just me, 
or our students of color who need those institutions. So does the young man who spit at me. We need you to love us enough to correct us when we're wrong, protect us when we're scared, and build us into leaders for the collective, people who turn hope into reality and justice into life. Love us enough to build that. I love you enough and me enough. I love the people who've hurt me enough and the man who spit at me enough to ask us to do that. See, that can only happen when we determine my story to be a cautionary tale of history and not a tragic story of the future. When we decide that the moral imperative is for all of us to bear and not just our colleagues of color. I believe that we will write the story. It's on us. I, I truly believe we are the authors the world has been waiting for. That we can be the beloved community. That we are the people who search for learning and affliction, joy in our pain, triumph in the midst of struggle. We are the ones we've been waiting for to write the vision and to make it plain, to get to victory. So let's write the story. Thank you so much.